You probably remember that proverb that you read many years ago. The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. And uh, my mum's favourite book of the Bible was the book of Proverbs. She would read a single proverb and meditate on it and think about it. And one of the questions that she would probably ask about that, and I don't remember her reading that particular proverb, what does it mean? What is the connection between a furnace for gold and a crucible for silver and the Lord testing our hearts? And brothers and sisters, we're going to explore that today. And I was very surprised when I, Pastor Phil recorded his message, sent it to me yesterday, and I began editing it, and I wrote, there was no collusion between him and I. Praise God for his good work. Um, I often look and ask the question, what is it that will help us as children of God, living in perilous times, make it into God's kingdom as his children? What is it that will form his righteous character in us so that we are image bearers of Jesus and that you and I know absolutely that you and I are loved and Christ is in us? And as we explore that, and most of the scriptures I've got on the screen, and the first one that I want to talk about is from the book of Acts. We read in chapter 14 this narrative that goes on in the first century church, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. So first strengthening the souls of disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. They were living under Roman occupation. It wasn't easy to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, I like the first two things, but the last one makes me ponder and think, what is the meaning of that? That through many tribulations, difficulties, challenges, trials and tests, they will enter the kingdom of God. And the question I want to ask is, why did the author draw that conclusion there? Well, I want to start off with Apostle Paul. And if I use Apostle Paul as an example, you'll probably say, well, Paul was a really extraordinary, unusual character. God told him right from the beginning, I will sh when he spoke to Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Saul, who became Paul, ended up really suffering. Paul wrote to those in Corinth in his second letter to encourage them. He says five times, in 2 Corinthians 11, 24, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 39 lashes. I remember being whipped on the backside by a physical education teacher once in my life. That was pretty sore and painful. But five times at the hands of the Jews, he was a public spectacle in a public square receiving 49, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Ghastly. Now, you can say again, Paul was an exceptional fellow. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day adrift at sea. Have you ever been shipwrecked, floating on some flotsam? Praying to God? I haven't. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, dangers from false brothers. Oh, that's a spanner's in the work. Judas type of people. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul's not making this up. He says, this is what I'm going through. This is my life. When the Lord spoke to Ananias and said, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. This is Paul's testimony. And verse 28, and apart from other things, there's a daily pressure for me in looking after all the churches. So that's Paul's testimony. And he said, that's my lot. And I'm being truthful. And I'm not sugarcoating it. Now, straight away I can hear hands going up and say, oh, but John, that was Apostle Paul living in Roman occupation and it was a dangerous time and, and it was... A yes, but can I ask some more questions? Let's go back in the history of the Bible and look at some faithful, godly people. Why did God allow righteous Joseph to be thrown for years and years in an Egyptian prison on false charges? I know he ended up a second to Pharaoh in the end, but some testimonies say he was 12 and a half years in prison in an Egyptian prison. Why did God allow? Joseph was given dreams and visions. He was going to be a provider for his people, a son of promise. Let me ask another question from the Bible. Why did God allow young David, who was anointed by Samuel as the next king in succession, 
to spend his life fleeing and hiding in caves, afraid of the incumbent. Why did God do it that way? He suffered terribly, fearful for his life. You have an example, in, I think in Kings, where Elisha and his servant are surrounded by enemy armies. And the young servant is just afraid of his life because they are just men living in a tent. And there's tightly trained armies around. And then God, Elisha, Elisha prays. And all of a sudden the young man sees the angelic hosts all around. But why did God let the young man almost wet himself out of fear because he knew they were going to be slaughtered? Why did God allow it to get like that? You know the story of Daniel and Lion's Den. Why did God allow Daniel to be thrown into a den of hungry lions when everybody knew what the result was? Those lions were kept hungry for a reason. Why did God not intervene and let Daniel... Now, you know the story. God closed the lies, mouths of the lions. But imagine if you were on that rope being let down by hardened soldiers. It's a bit tough. And I'm saying, God, what are you doing? I think these are really good, honest questions to ask. Now, you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Why did God allow them... Now, they had courage and they said, King, we don't have to be careful to answer you in this. If God is able to save us, so be it. But if he doesn't, we will still not worship your idol. And what the King Nebuchadnezzar does, he gets really angry. And he says he heated the furnace up seven times hotter. Now, how many of you have been to the, 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 the Perth Mint? and seeing gold being poured out. Uh, gold melts at 1,064 degrees Celsius, so it gets very hot and yellow. Um, aluminium melts at 660 degrees Celsius. Iron melts at 1,500 and something degrees Celsius. Now, the ancients were good at melting. We know they had bronze, iron, silver and gold. In fact, Remember the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of a great image composed of those metals? And later on, Nebuchadnezzar knew how to melt gold because he made a massive big image and told everybody to bow down to it. So I want to talk about what a furnace is. And in building up for this sermon message, I decided to go out and make my own furnace. So I got ceramic bricks and then I made a cardboard mould and I put some, some chicken wire in there. And then I poured high refractory cement in there to make a lid so I could lift it off the furnace. Then I bought some 1400 degrees Celsius ceramic wool and then imported from Amazon in the United States some high temperature bricks and, and then slowly building a furnace. So I could see what Nebuchadnezzar's furnace looked like. And then, as you can see, it runs by gas. There's a blowtorch in there. And yesterday I fired it up for the very first time. And within 30 seconds, it was yellow hot inside. This is a mini furnace and we're going to fire it up now and bring it up to about a thousand degrees which is a sufficient temperature to melt gold. Um, Nebuchadnezzar had a massive furnace, it was enough for four people to walk around in. But this is only a mini one and we're going to bring it up to temperature. But remember Nebuchadnezzar brought his up to seven times the, the heat of the big smelter that they had there. Which means it wasn't red hot, it wasn't yellow hot, it would have been white hot. Extraordinary circumstances. Okay, let's get this fired up. And if I leave that running for 10 minutes, I can melt aluminium and I can melt gold and I can melt brass. So I've been building that for my own personal reasons as well as to illustrate the story. And here's an example of somebody belt, melting down bullet cases. We live in the YouTube universe, so all that I've done there, I've followed everybody's success stories in making a smelter. Nebuchadnezzar heated that furnace seven times more. Now, whether that's just an arbitrary figure, if you're melting, let's say, gold at 1,064 degrees that Celsius, that means that furnace was pushed well above its capacity, probably to 7,000 degrees. They were no fools. They knew how to manage metals and metallurgy. Because the soldiers who took Shadrach and Meshach and Bendigo into that fire perished instantly. And I'm asking the question, brothers and sisters, why did God allow those poor boys three young, healthy, vibrant, intelligent men who expressed faith in God to go through it. Now, you and I know 
one like the Son of God was walking in the flames with them. They came out. There was not even the singeing or the smell of smoke on them. So God left a very powerful testimony and legacy through difficult times. That's not to minimise the moment when they were being thrown into the fire and the soldiers turned into crisps who were trying to do it. What about women? Why did God allow Esther to put her life on the line and then see wicked Haman build a great tall gallows to hang her benevolent and good uncle on in the next morning? Would you sleep that night? These are the questions that the biblical narrative So, If Apostle Paul is an unusual character, God's people and faithful people throughout history have faced challenging times. I'm not going to even talk about poor old Job. I've read Job many times. And um, what I do want to say is that human life and human story has been written in oppression and in blood and in suffering and in the shedding of blood. And that's why Jesus came at that particular time right in Roman occupation, because there was no question what was going to happen. You know, what's interesting is that God's people have always grown and matured and developed in holiness and sanctification because of different times. Can you imagine Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego with desperate prayers crying out to God? They did. Daniel, Joseph... Or God's faithful people, we are taken to a point of desperation when you and I know that we have no more arrows in our quiver, no more cards in our sleeve, and then God acts. And Rebecca and I have had many experiences in our lives. We said, why did God wait till the last minute? I remember standing on a broken down freeway with a, saying, God, I don't know what to do. And then a friendly mechanic just turned up. And he was more than just a mechanic. The bottom line is, is that as we see the great empires around the world. God used those empires to forge something. Why did God allow the, the promised seed of Abraham to spend 400 years in Egypt and end up being an absolutely enslaved people? And how many women cried when their little children, boys, were thrown and drowned in the Nile River? That was hardship. Now we read it through the sanitised pages of three and a half thousand years. But the reality is these things happened. And I cherish our little ones and I feel for the grief and the pain and the suffering. Yet all this tension, all this uncertainty, all this desperation for those who prayed leaves a very powerful testimony because when the Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea many years later, it was as if God's justice had been executed in a very powerful and, and way. And um, so that leads me to another question that I used to ask as a boy growing up in the faith. God, you created the Garden of Eden, you placed man in there, you brought woman to him, it was, you set the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Why, God, did you allow the devil, the serpent of old, to come slithering in, whispering in Eve's ear? You know, why? It's, it's a recipe for disaster, God. God knows what he can do. Now, Gold, for example, I've got a, a furnace here. Somebody's tipping out some gold that they've smelted in a, in a crucible there. Wealth, if this world is truly measured in gold. And um, you remember um, Nebuchadnezzar's gold? A lot of that gold was sto stolen from the ancient Israelites. But n when Solomon built his temple, read about the gold that he procured in that temple. The big labours out the front were all gold. Later on when they were stolen, they put bronze ones out there. Um, we still discover gold artefacts in Egypt on the burial mummies, etc. The great empires were marked by gold. And you know Nebuchadnezzar's dream? The head of gold. And then he builds a complete gold statue. The gold has always been. So I went to the Perth Mint one day and I came out with what looks like a kilo of pure gold. Now, people have walked into my office and says, John... I wouldn't leave that lying around there. Now, it's got plastic underneath. It didn't cost me $75,000, but market value is $75,000. I'll come back to this in a moment. The idea of challenges times, if I go and bring up 1 Peter, 1 Peter talks about difficult times. And he says, in this you rejoice, 1 Peter 1 verse 6, in this you rejoice that for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, and he's speaking to an audience in the first century, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
which is more precious than gold that perishes though tested by fire. Now, I don't think gold perishes, but apparently it does. And the, your faith being tested by fire, by this kind of furnace, really burning, where you burn all the dross of it, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a purpose why God allows suffering and anguish and prayers of desperation. You know, there was a church in Laodicea. John was in the Isle of Patmos. He was in prison, in exile there. God gave him a revelation. It became the book of Revelation. He says, write to the seven churches. And there was a church in Laodicea, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey today, that did not have Jesus as a part of their culture. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will open to him and come to him and dine with him. So there was a church culture that felt they were rich. They said, we are rich. We have need from nothing. And Jesus says in Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich. What's Jesus talking about? This refining process of gold and, and why is it so relevant for us? Well, here in Australia, the Logies are a television award program and people walk out. If you've been a really good actor or actress, you walk out with a little gold statue of a, uh, honouring your contribution to, to television. If you're in the rest of the world, the Oscars are Hollywood's great crowning moment. That all the actors around who've actually won the hearts and acclaim of millions of people walk out with a little gold statue that signifies their greatness in the eyes of many people. And for a lot of people, you know, you want to be, you, 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 the media makes it out that this is the highest that you could ever go with the greatest acclaim, that you are a great part of the world community because of your acting and the, and the contribution that you've made in telling storytelling. But there's another side to it, and I want to draw the spiritual side to it. Lee Marvin, who died in 1987 of a heart attack, reached that height of acting in Korea and he said something that showed that it wasn't all that the world made it out to be. He said, they put your name on a star on Hollywood Boulevard and I've walked on that boulevard many years ago and then you look up next time and there's a pile of dog manure on top of it. He said, that's really what it's all about, life, this glamour, this is, that's the story. By contrast, Peter Kreft in his book Three Philosophies of Life said, the world's purest gold is only dung without Christ. Let me read that again. The world's purest gold. And if I had $75,000... Now, one of my friends says, John, I won't tell anybody else, but in my, my house I've got several of these nuggets tucked away. You know, I'm sort of preparing for the future. So he, I was shocked. He didn't show them to me, but he told me about them. But from our viewpoint as followers of Christ who look for an eternal kingdom and not on the things of this temporal world, the world's purest gold is only dung without Christ but Christ, with Christ, the basest metal is transformed into the purest gold. What God is doing in our lives is allowing circumstances and challenges, like the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's, like the Daniels, like the Josephs, like the Esthers throughout history, to be able to be transformed into something awesome. Now, David went through some really hard times. I mentioned him briefly, fleeing for his life. And... As a result of his tribulation, he has an amazing testimony. It's almost like a disconnect. You think he would say, God, why did you allow this to happen? And certainly if you read the Psalms, there's that element there. But then he says something like, God is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. An ever-present help in time of need. You can only say that if you've had your back against the wall and Saul threw a spear and it just missed you. And again, you, your life has been spared. He says, when I walk through the, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no ill, for you are with me and your rod and staff, they comfort me. Now, what does the valley of the shadow of death look like? Have you ever been holding somebody's hand when they've been dying of cancer? Have you ever been in... I know some of us have, because we have church community, and I know some of our stories, and I'm thankful for the powerful testimonies. You know, in Psalm 34, David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous... Is that the end of the sentence? No. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now the only way somebody could say that is they've been through tough stuff. 
You know, Jesus, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, I've said these things to you, and he's talking to his disciples, and by extension, we are followers of Christ, disciples as well, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will, not you might, you will have tribulation, but he says, take heart, or be of good cheer, says another translation, I have overcome the world. And you know many times Jesus says, fear not, don't be afraid. Isaiah 43 tells us something. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That's a very powerful statement. Remarkable. God gives us remarkable assurances. Now, I want to talk about the contrast of this universe. And you and I see the handiwork of God. The universe is very, very cold and inhospitable to human life. The universe is minus 270 degrees. It's very cold. And scientists look, recognising that we're a, a planet around a star that's halfway through its life. If we can get off this earth, we can continue living as this evolved species and populate the world universe. Let's try the moon. Let's try Mars. But the Mars and moon are very highly radioactive. And then we have to ask, them, why isn't the earth radioactive? The life that we have on the Earth is perfectly balanced and pure, this blue planet, for supporting human life. It's created to perfection at the right distance from the sun. Scientists ask, how come we have an iron core, but we also have water? Maybe water arrived on the Earth through a, 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 a gaseous asteroid that came later. We have nitrogen, oxygen, gold, carbon, all the elements perfect for human life. And you and I see the handiwork of God and go praise and glory and honour to God. But the blinded eyes of, of the world don't see and give God the glory. The perfect gravity on this earth. And we glorify God. But the irony is, then why is life so hard for so many people? If you've lived a good life and you've not been through difficult times, we'll give God glory and the strength. But most people of this world have lived through bloodshed and suffering. Somebody made the point about more people are wealthy in the world than they ever have been and there's more middle class citizens in the world. Statistically though, if you have some loose change in your pocket and you have a bank account in your name and there was one other small element, I can't remember what it was, you are the top 8% of people in the world. The rest of the world, 92% live below that. Now, most of us, when we go on holidays overseas, we go to the beautiful spots with spas and pools. By God's grace in ministry, I've been to many places where that doesn't exist. And I've seen the suffering of many people in God's purpose. And so, a lot of people, life is hard, life is unjust, and life is fair, and they go to their graves never experiencing justice. But you and I, living in this broken environment, have a certain hope. And we know where it's ending because God has promised it and he's made extraordinary promises that you and I wake to every day. Now you know the challenges that exist. Jesus spoke to those disciples and he said, if anyone must come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. That's not sugarcoating it. That's telling the reality. You know, when he also says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. They will put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And of those disciples, only John lived in Ephesus to a very old age. All the others lost their lives through some form of martyrdom. And you think, God, why do you do this? But the analogy is, out of the fiery furnace comes pure gold. On a physical level, uh, we can talk about. You know, I emptied my fireplace the other day from the winter winter we don't have a fire this time of year so I took the ashes out and I spread them under the fruit tree and very fine white ash powder wafted in the air that's made of carbon if you go to the Argyle diamond mine that same carbon that I just threw out on the ground is actually diamonds and those diamonds formed out of extreme heat and extreme pressure I read an article of how the Argyle pink diamond is formed the pressure it takes is 640 elephants putting the weight on one stiletto heel for a long period of time. Whoa! So that same wood fire that I threw out the dust, the, char the charcoal and the ashes, that same element under that kind of pressure produces a diamond that a woman wears on her wedding day 
on a ring and a queen wears in her crown. But that diamond would never form just through no pressure, no trial. You know? And so, like gold, like silver, it's purified and forged in fire. And God can do something in an adversarial environment where the devil has limited power in this world. And um, this idea of fire and this idea of foundation and what are you and I made of comes out in Paul's letter also to those in Corinth, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3. He says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid on Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand, we sing. Now if anyone builds on a foundation of gold, silver and precious stones, wood, hay and straw. So he's showing what is your life made of? When times get really tough, will you come out as pure gold or will you turn out like smoke when straw and wood and, 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 and hay is burned up? Because he says each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And scripture also says that judgment is now on the household of God. I don't want any of us to go through difficult times. But I've also learned that on the other side of difficulty comes maturity, beauty, humility, righteousness, willingness, sacrifice, empathy. Somebody made the comment, and I can't remember who the author was, when God uses a man or a woman, he always breaks them first. And I was thinking about that. Well, I know when a young man signs up to the army, he's fresh and alive, the first thing they do is shave his hair mess around with his identity, break him down in the mud and the slush and the military, and then they rebuild this young man up into the military soldier that they want. Well, the Lord does that. When we come out of the waters of baptism, our old self is washed away and we begin the life of a new creation. And, and God uses trials and tribulations and difficulties to forge through fiery furnaces like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, eternal value that will last forever. Joseph was imprisoned. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness. You know, as a young 40-year-old man, he took things into his own hands and slayed an Egyptian taskmaster. 40 years later, God said, now, Moses, you're ready for work. And he says, uh, I've got to stand and I can't go, and will you someone hold my hand, etc. What about Paul? He spent three days in Damascus blind before Ananias prayed for him and scales came off his eyes. And it didn't take him 40 years. God has a way of breaking us, but he also, what he's making is better and more powerful. And, um, and I like that, you know. Now, somebody once said, in their suffering, God doesn't know what it is like for me to be suffering. And that person was a woman. She was really struggling and she had had a hard life. But there's a scripture that speaks into that. Um... Hebrews 2 verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. I love archaeology. I spent some time in the city of David, archaeological excavations many years ago. But more recently, they found an ossuary. And in that ossuary, they found a, a 30, 24 year old young man's heel where they nail the nail through his heel this way. And we've always seen traditional pictures where Jesus' feet were nailed like that with a nail through it. Archaeology shows that on, their legs were on both sides of the stake and the nails went in from sideways. And Jesus suffered. The one who spoke everything into existence, together with the Father, who divested himself of his former glory, entered a time of Roman occupation to die for our sins as an atonement that we could be made righteous with God. So the captain of our salvation, as another translation says, was made complete or perfect through suffering. And Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they've listened to me, they'll listen to you as well. You know, Isaiah 53 describes Jesus in a prophetic, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And there's a powerful lesson for us. You know, have you ever prayed a desperate prayer? I hope you don't, but it's a, there's a, it's a very powerful therapy where you go before God in desperation. Kenneth, Kenneth Boer, in his book, um, Conformed to Christ, on page 453, he says, Without a growing sense of desperation, we will not maintain our focus on God, because then we become self-reliant, and that's the risk factor. 
The Lord lovingly uses trials and adversities in a variety of creative ways in our lives and a part of the purpose of our suffering is to dr drive us to dependence on, on him alone. God, I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my life. You know. And he made the point in the article that sometimes it takes people till a midlife crisis when they begin to experience diminishing capacity and greater responsibility that they realise that they've got to come to grips with their mortality. Because otherwise, you know, when you're young and strong and fit, I don't care about this God thing. You know, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.18 says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Keep that thought in your mind. I feel for people who suffer. We have a lot that we can do to alleviate and help the suffering of others by praying with them, by praying for them, by joining them in their suffer. You know, mourn with those who mourn, weep with, with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. The interesting thing why I raised the subject about living in this world, not being of this world, is that even though the world was created through him and for him, the world was inhospitable to Christ. How ironic. You know, John 1.10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now, if you made something, you know, let's say I made this furnace, and I enjoyed making a furnace, and everybody looks at him and says, John, you never made that. That's not yours. I, say, I did make it. No, no, you, you know. Jesus came to his own in verse 11, and his own people did not receive him. The, the, the children of Abraham, the children of promise, the people that God worked with for generation after generation, the, 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 the narrative of coming through the Red Sea, of the Joseph being in prison and the second to Pharaoh, of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, of Esther, of Daniel, of Hannah, of many of others. And they, Jesus comes to those, that family and they don't recognise him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, the captain of our salvation who suffered. I'm going to wrap up in the next few moments, but I, one of the scriptures that really speak to me, Jesus says to Peter and to the other disciples, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew the challenging times in which his body, the body of Christ, would exist. And there's two ways of looking at that. The church takes ministry into the darkest, most wicked corners of the world. Or the wicked corners of the world are trying to assail us. And the church, the body of Christ, prevails. And that's very powerful because Jesus knew the climate that we would live post first century, second, third, fourth. Here we are in 2020. And I'm very encouraged when I look at the narrative of those faithful people behind us. And this year we've gone through COVID-19 and the uncertainty of what next year will look like and the changing economic world where the United States is becoming weaker and other forces are becoming stronger. And brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6.10, and in the strength of his might. Put on the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the loins of truth, the gospel of peace. Because you and I are given an opportunity to have a testimony. And that testimony, brothers and sisters, is born of experience, forged on suffering, that in the name of Jesus equals no other. God is sovereign, and his sovereignty is manifest in brokenness and suffering. Finally, the crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests the hearts. And the parable that we've shared today becomes just so much more clearer.